I'm go gonna share the screen, at least this screen, uh, and start the presentation. All right, so I will do my best to uh, monitor things um, during the presentation. I'll be checking the chat every so often. Uh, this is part of the reason, actually, that I don't uh, use Ecamm Live for these presentations anymore. I should really talk to my friend Kat Mulvihill because uh, she probably has like a whole way to do this. But um, when I have my virtual camera, I do have like these nifty kind of setups, but then I I can't really see anything. So uh, this will do and it'll be great. And I'll see the Zoom controls here as people chat. So uh, recording is in progress. Let's get started. All right. So I know I just told you I'm a huge baseball fan. I'm also a huge Star Wars fan. And if you are also at least a moderate Star Wars fan, you will recognize this scene from The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, this is when Luke's X-Wing is sinking into the swamps on Dagobah and he's trying to lift it out using the force. He's a pretty green force user. Uh, and he says, I can't do it. It's impossible. This is where the famous do or do not. There is no try line from Yoda uh, kind of comes from uh, not kind of definitely comes from Um and let's see. Uh, and Luke says he can't do it. And um, and Yoda says, watch, right? He says size matters not. And he lifts the X-Wing out of the swamp. Now, fast forward 30 to 40-ish years. And we're looking at the rise of Skywalker. Uh, it's like poetry. It rhymes, uh, is what George Lucas said. Luke is the one lifting the X-Wing out of uh, the... Oh, my gosh. I forget the name of the planet he's on. But he's lifting the sunken X-Wing out of the water as if to show people, yes, I have mastered the Force and I now can lift the X-Wing. Uh, and I'm telling you all of this because Luke was a new force user. Ray was a relatively new force user here. Um, and so trying to lift an X-Wing on your first day is hard and discouraging. Luke, because he got like the whiny Skywalker gene, uh, was very discouraged and wanted to quit. He said it's impossible. Ray, in that moment in Rise of Skywalker, uh, felt like she was stuck. She couldn't leave because she couldn't lift the X-Wing. But you don't start with lifting an X-Wing out of water. Uh, and I'm telling you this because, well, podcasting can feel really overwhelming too. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things you need to consider. And so you want to start with something easier. So I recommend starting with a mini podcast because just like Ray and Luke started with moving rocks, that was the easier thing to do, pulling some stuff towards them, pushing some stuff towards them while they built up to being able to pull that X-Wing out of the water. Uh, starting a mini podcast really reduces the load for creating a show. Usually these, sometimes they're called solo casts. I've heard them called that as well. Um, they're less than 20 minutes. They're solo shows. So you don't need to coordinate with guests, which is some of the uh, most time consuming things, right? Figuring out uh, who you're going to have on your show, which means research, talking to those people, booking times with them, hoping the recording goes well. And so that adds a lot of work to the podcast. Uh, I also, uh, let's see, I, I saw some other new people come in. So if you if you just came in, say hello. Let me know how it's going, uh, where you're coming from. Um, so a solo show gets rid of all of that. It's just you, your voice, and your expertise. And this is the other thing, right? It showcases your expertise. I'll talk about why this is really important. But when you showcase your expertise, it means that you're not, you don't have to do a ton of research. 
Um, and because it's just you and your schedule, these episodes are easier to batch. I started a daily podcast uh, about three weeks ago now. Uh, so five episodes a week. I skip the weekends, um, which seems really wild because I also, you know, full time produce uh, my um, How I Built It show and I do a locally focused show with my friend Liam and I run a coaching business and I have three kids and a daily podcast just seems like a lot. But because it's a mini podcast, it's a lot easier for me to manage. So we'll talk about that in a bit, too. Uh, and so I've alluded to this, but I got this question during another webinar I ran. How do you run three podcasts with three kids? And the answer is partially my processes are really good, right? I've I've automated. I've created good processes. I have really good uh, workflows. And I, I work with a VA who does a lot of uh, a lot of the stuff for me. But the other thing is that I've leaned into doing mini podcasts. And so Cesar says here, uh, already launched my interview-based podcast, but it's getting stale. We'll add 20-minute episodes with 50-minute interview episodes a month. This is great. This is exactly what I've started doing for How I Built It. How I Built It, I launched it in 2016. It was a, a, a full uh, interview show. And over the last maybe a uh, couple of years, is when I finally started um, actually doing the uh, the solo shows. And that, that has made it uh, a lot easier for me as well. This is one of the reasons that I can uh, kind of run several podcasts. And, and my other show, po the Podcast Workflows Daily podcast, um, that one is only me. So uh, that's... Um, Sorry, I just turned off the join sound because it was getting distracting. Uh, but not the people joining. Cecilia, thanks for being here. Thanks for joining. Um, so lost my train of thought here for a second. All right, so the 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 podcast workflows daily show that is a mini podcast. I'm gonna try this. Let me know. Oh well, first of all, y'all are seeing the wrong thing anyway. Um, yeah, this is not gonna. Uh, sadly, this is not gonna work for me. Um, I was really hoping I can do some whiz bang stuff, but I'm not all the way at the whiz bang stuff stage yet for, for this. Okay. Uh, so let me know. My screen sharing is paused is what this says. It's also like not a live presentation, uh, un unless you run into some technical difficulties, right? This was my fault for trying to switch out. Um, but to kind of to answer the question that this intrepid person asked during my presentation, um, how do you run three podcasts with three kids? Uh, part of it is my processes, but a another big portion of it is uh, the fact that I'm doing more solo shows. And so the goals of this webinar, I'm going to give you everything that you need to launch your podcast, uh, to launch your mini podcast. I'm going to kind of give you all of the steps. And after this webinar is over, you'll get an email uh, with the fact that, uh, I'm sorry, with the uh, with a template, like a checklist template that I use to help me launch my shows. Um, Caesar, thanks so much for the kind words. Uh, LinkedIn course on leveraging AI for podcasting. That's a That wasn't a plant. That was a little shout out. So I appreciate that. Uh, so the goals of this webinar, I'm going to tell you how you can define your mission statement. I'm going to give you the best way to publish your show. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you everything to help you launch your show. So the outline, what's a mission statement, how to record and edit, where to publish, your call to action, how to promote, how to make money. And then we'll do a QA. and a I got lots of great questions from people who filled out the form. So I'm real excited about that. Okay, so first, let's talk about your mission statement. 78% of people listen to podcasts to learn something new, according to Statista 2. Uh, what that means is that 78% of people are looking for growth. They have a problem that they want solved. Yes, some people only listen for entertainment. Some people do it for, you know, maybe both they'll listen to. Uh, American storytellers 
but then they'll also listen to like the number one marketing podcast in the world, hashtag best or whatever, right? But 78% of people listen to podcasts, learn something new. If you are a small business owner, solopreneur, or if you work for a company who's thinking about launching a podcast, this is really important because you want them to know that you are an expert that can help them in your particular field. Uh, so let's see, got some comments here. Will Joe's kids become podcasters? They love playing with my microphone. Uh, as a professor of media, tell them something they don't already know. Jacqueline, I love that. Um, so here's with all of that, right? Here is what your mission statement should be. My podcast helps particular audience solve particular problem by, and then the goal of each episode, right? So if we look at uh, podcast workflows, my daily podcast, my mini podcast. My podcast helps busy solopreneurs solve the problem of spending too much time on their podcast by showing them how experts produce their show, right? That is the mission statement of podcast workflows. The mission statement of how I built it is very similar. I'm a busy solopreneur, and so I like helping busy solopreneurs. But my podcast helps busy solopreneurs and creators uh, solve the problem of spending too much time in their business by giving them free coaching calls from successful creators and actionable advice from those interviews. That's an interview show. So this mission statement answers three questions. Who are my listeners? What problems do they have? And how can I help them solve that problem? Who are my listeners? What problems do they have? And how can I help them solve their problems? Right. And Cesar, I'm uh, Cesar. Uh, first of all, I, I always ask you, I think I'm saying that right. Right. It's Cesar and not like Caesar, like, like Julius Caesar. Um, my limiting belief, he says, is that I assume what I know, other people probably know it. So they won't care. I share it. That is. Yeah, that is an incredible limiting belief, but it's something that all of us have, right? Um, there is an XKCD comic out there uh, that talks about um, the reaction to someone not knowing what you already know or not seeing what you've already seen. Um, and usually people are like, oh, I can't believe you didn't know that. But it should be exciting, right? Like, oh, I've never seen Star Wars. Most people are like, you've never seen Star Wars. But the reaction should be, You've never seen Star Wars. Like, I get to show you Star Wars, right? And so, uh, Cesar, I would say, first of all, no matter where you are in your journey, there's always going to be people, like, 10 steps ahead and people 10 steps behind, right? That's just the... That's life, right? Um, As somebody who's been teaching for over a decade now, I can tell you that there are lots of people who don't know what you already know. And uh, the, the thing that crystallized this the most for me was uh, when I was doing freelance web development work, I would sit down with clients to train them on the new website that I built for them. And they would say something to the effect of, oh, I'm really sorry. I'm, I'm bad with technology. Or like, oh, I'm really bad with computers. And I would always say, if everyone was as good with computers as I am, I would have no job. So I would say, uh, Cesar, as long as you have a job, there are people who don't know what you know. Because if everybody knew what you knew, knew, nobody would need to hire you. All right. So that's your mission statement. Uh, let me know if there are any more questions about that. Or if you are working on your podcast, share your mission statement in the chat. I'd love to see what you've come up with who your audience is, and how you help them solve a problem. Let me know. Drop your mission statement in the chat if you have one or if you're workshopping one. I'm happy to uh, give you some feedback on that. So once you have your mission statement, you want to start creating the content. Uh, so I strongly recommend starting with an outline. This is an outline from another presentation I did called Why You Should Use Descript or Descript. Sorry, uh, folks from Descript. Uh, why you should use Descript for your mini podcast. An outline is really good here, right? Because presumably you're picking something that you are an expert in, right? I am a an expert in podcast systems, especially, but 
I've been podcasting for over a decade as well. And so uh, I know a lot of stuff about podcasting, which means I probably don't need to do a ton of research um, outside of maybe checking on like that stat that I gave you. Like I, I've, I have that memorized now. The only time I ever go back to check it is to make sure it hasn't changed. Right. So uh, you can create an outline here. These will give you the broad strokes, the talking points that you want to have for your episodes. Again, your goal is 20 minutes or less. Some of my mini episodes are five minutes, right? It's it's like that really annoying teacher answer of however long you need it to be to get your point across. Uh, so you want to think about uh, that when you create an outline. And again, I would strongly recommend, um, I guess I should really step back here and say like the the axiom right the main theory i'm working on for this whole presentation is you want to start a podcast but you're worried it's going to take too much time this is the number one fear i hear from people i want to start a podcast but i just don't know if i have the time i want to start a second podcast but my other podcast already takes me so much time so with a mini podcast we're trying to uh, strip away the stuff that takes the most amount of time. Booking guests takes a lot of time. Doing a ton of research takes a ton of time. Full writing scripts takes a lot of time. However, this is where your time may be well spent, and I'll get to that in a second. But let's say you picked a topic you know really well. For most people, I think an outline would work really well. Now, there are some pros and cons to this, right? Um, so let's talk about if you should script your mini podcast. Pros. Some people are are more comfortable writing, right? The words flow better when they're writing them on paper or on screen. Uh, this is assuming you're not using AI to write your scripts. I have strong opinions about that. Um, but some people are more comfortable writing. And if you are, then you should absolutely write your script. Because if you're worried that you're going to stumble through what you're trying to say or not really make the point as succinctly as you'd like, a script would be better. Uh, you will make sure you need to say everything you need to say. This is, uh, again, another really important thing. Like, And if you're not doing a live stream or a live presentation like this, it's it's probably okay. You can go and like add a point in post, right? Like you can ADR, it's called that. Um, and But... When you have a script, you will uh, make sure that you say everything you need to say. And then a script is easier to repurpose, right? For for podcast workflows, actually, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, they are short, like five, five-ish minute episodes. And they are usually social posts or emails I've sent. So I just kind of read them. I add a little flourish, right? Uh, add a little extra for the people who are listening. But Wednesday's episodes are deep dives. They're 20 minutes. And I, I dive deep into uh, this week. It was Justin Jackson from Transistor. Uh, I, I looked at how he and his partner, John, built uh, the Build Your SaaS podcast and all of the benefits from that. And so that's deeply researched. It took me, I don't know, 8 to 10 hours, maybe 8 to 12 hours to research and write. Uh, and I just read that verbatim, right? And so that is a written to be read article, essentially. So that blog post becomes an episode. Your episode scripts can become blog posts, vice versa. Cons, it adds to production time, right? It takes you, maybe if you're going to sit down and really think about it, it'll take you 20 to 30 minutes to make an outline of a topic you know really well. Writing a script takes a lot longer. Right. Uh, it's because you you're going to have your outline and then you're going to write the thing you want to say and you're going to rewrite it and you're going to read it and you're going to see how it flows. Um, and I'm going to say, like, but because of your mission statement, you might not have to script um, because the other con is that you could fall to perfectionism. Right. Oh, I don't say this exactly the way I want to say it. Uh, the script is no good. I'm just not going to do an episode. Right. Uh, and so there are pros and cons to that. I'm going to say. When I first gave this, I was very bullish on don't script unless you really, really feel you have to. Now it's do what you're most comfortable with. 
if a script is going to help you press record, absolutely have a script, right? The goal here is to press record. And so if words flow better for you uh, when you write them, create a script or find some hybrid, right? I interviewed a guy named uh, Josh Burnoff. He wrote a book called Build a Better Business Book. And he introduced me to the concept of the fat outline where you don't just have the outline like I showed you a couple of slides ago. You have this outline, but then you also have like paragraphs underneath each point. And so that gives you a really strong starting point to maybe talk and riff a little. You make your point and then you riff a little. You make your point and then you tell a personal story that you really don't need a script for. Uh, and then the other pro I'm going to mention here that I didn't mention on the slides is that a script will help you tell a better story. And I think that telling a story is the most important part. I'll talk about that more at the end, though. Okay. Wow. Didn't realize this slide would look like that in full screen for me. I'm sorry if this is like giving you a headache. I'll move on quickly. Avoid having guests and episodes that require a lot of research for you. This is what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to move on from here. Uh, this is, I'll move back. Uh, this is what I'm going to tell you uh, for your mini podcast. Don't have guests. If you're starting a mini podcast from scratch, right? If you're like me or like Cesar and we already have an interview show and we're trying to make it a little bit easier, then keep having guests, right? If that's the content that's working for you, but do more mini episodes. Uh, I had a coaching client. Her name is Annie. She's great. She has a podcast called Up Your Nursing Game. If you are a nurse and you need education credits, her podcast counts as education credits, which is amazing. Um, I told my wife about it. I'm like, you should listen to this show instead of my wife's a nurse, uh, instead of like watching those really boring PowerPoint presentations. Right. So um, she was feeling really overwhelmed. Right. Uh, Annie was feeling really overwhelmed about having to do these episodes, get the interview. And then she would add interstitials where like she had she would have like lead in scripts and then her editor would edit them together. And then she would have to come up with questions for the education credits. And so when she came to me, we had a four week uh, engagement and she, she just felt really overwhelmed. Like she wanted to kind of stop doing the podcast. And I pitched her this idea of what if you do like your, your episodes are evergreen, right? So if people are looking at, at that point, she had a year of content. And so people who hadn't listened could use that content for their education credits. I said, what if you do one interview and then a mini episode? So like alternate between those. And that's what she's been doing. And her process has gotten a lot better. She's uh, last we spoke, she was feeling less overwhelmed and a lot better about the podcast. And I could tell that she really enjoys creating these mini episodes. So uh, if you are, you know, even if you have, uh, an interview style podcast, the mini podcast can really help. But if you are just starting today, I would say definitely go for, uh, not doing, uh, not having guests at least at first and, uh, not picking a topic where you would need to do a ton of research. Okay. So that's the content. If you have any questions, let me know if you, uh, if you got any ideas from that about like what you could do and if you currently have a podcast, like, oh, let me know if you're thinking of like maybe one solo episode that you can drop into your interview feed. Um, but let's let's move on to this next bit, um, because a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have been able to tell you. Hey, uh, solo podcasts, mini podcasts are a lot easier. Because Descript didn't exist, right? And so I'm going to say. When you get to recording and editing, Descript is a life changer uh, for the solo podcaster or the mini podcaster. Because you edit, if you haven't seen Descript yet, uh, you can edit by deleting text. And it's a very simple drag and drop interface. So what I will do is record my solo episodes. And if I mess up, I'll stop recording and I'll just delete that text and I'll start over. So that makes the process a lot faster for me. If you listen to my Wednesday episodes of podcast workflows, you'll also hear some sound effects. 
uh, some Foley, right? Which is like that background uh, sound effect stuff. Um, you'll hear when it's available to me, I'll, I'll drop audio from the subject, like from the podcaster into the feed and the production value will, will just be a lot higher, um, which is not something I think I would have been able to do with another editing program, just cause like editing, editing for me was really hard. This was one of the things that I knew straight away. Like I had to hire out. So Descript is a game changer. You can edit audio by deleting text. You can one click remove filler words. I don't think you should always do this, but this is where a script helps reduce the amount of filler words. I think if you remove every filler word, your podcast is going to sound unnatural, right? It's it's going to sound kind of robotic, right? Trying to get breaths out. Right. We breathe like Christina Nicholson said this, by the way, shout out to Christina, her book, Become a Media Maven Drop today. Uh, she said we breathe every day. <laughs> so like trying to edit out these natural things. Uh, might work against you, but. If you say um like four times in a row and you want to tighten up that section, yeah, definitely do that. If you breathe or make like some like weird mouth sound like into the microphone, yeah, like definitely try to replace that. Uh, and Descript makes it easier with the one click uh, remove filler words. Like you could search in the pro version, you can search for words, right? So if someone cursed a lot, I can just straight up delete the swear words, which is nice because uh, I want that clean rating. Um, and then there's studio sound. So if you are not recording in the best environment or if you have guests and your guest is not recording in the best environment, studio sound is basically one click cleanup. I did this recently with, uh, I, I had an in a, a casual interview with Jay Klaus about his production process, right? We talked for a while so that I could write a long form, uh, like a deep dive on him. And I recorded the interview. Uh, I told him I wouldn't release the video, but the audio had really good clips in it. Right. So, um, he wasn't at his normal setup. That's why he asked. He was like in the middle of, of moving or maybe he was on vacation or something like that. But um, and so I was able to clean up his audio and make it sound not as good as his normal setup, but really good. Not like he was using a built-in microphone thanks to studio sound. So I think Descript is a game changer, especially for solo podcasters. So that's Descript. Uh, if uh, I so I have a demo in uh, Podcast Foundry, which is my membership, um, but I also have a couple of YouTube videos on it. So if you're interested, let me know. I'll try to find those resources for you. Um, but Descript is a great app. I strongly recommend it. Uh, and and now um, since they acquired Squadcast, uh, you can also get like the remote interview recording tool along with Descript, which is super cool. Okay, so uh, let me know how you're doing in the chat, if all of this is making sense or if I've totally lost some of you. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. If you use Descript, tell, like, let me know if it's great, if it's not. Uh, or if you've never heard of Descript, let me know what you think of that. Um, so uh, let's see. So uh, Mar I hope I'm saying your name right, Marquita. This was... a I don't know if you, this looks like a relevant question, but it was a direct message to me. So just let me know if you're cool with me reading this on the stream. Otherwise I'll send you a message later. Um, I see Cesar said, saw a podcaster uh, that's doing five minute episode summaries of the, the previous 50 minute episode um, as a way to repurpose content. I think that's really cool. Uh, so I was trying to do this uh, for a while, but my process wasn't very good at first. And I realized that like my older catalog didn't really fit the current mission statement. But um, if you're struggling for like ideas for what your solo episodes could be, if you have an interview show, yeah, summarize the last few episodes, talk about your favorite takeaways from each one and maybe how you've applied them since the interview. Right. So uh, I had, um, 
who was a recent guest? Well, I had uh, my assistant Jordan on the show a couple weeks ago, right? And after we spoke, uh, I uh, I had already hired her, but she uh, she gave me some more ideas for how we could better work together that we've since implemented. Um, you know, I've had guests who, who have given me like direct advice on, um, uh, I've I've had uh, guests who have said like, oh, this is like one tweak you can make to your landing page, and I did it right after the interview. So like by the time the interview was up that change is something I had already made. Uh, okay, so before we get to batching content, uh, Marquita, thank you uh, for confirming the pronunciation uh, and for saying I could uh, ask, read this question to the group. Thinking about starting a mini podcast, uh, sharing quick wisdom nuggets on life in the form of reading short stories, meditations, and affirmations. Would this fit a mini podcast? Uh, yeah, I think that's really good, right? Especially um, for, for, I think that you would want to really dial in who you help here right it sounds like um maybe this could be uh people who are overwhelmed right so like one good example actually is um i'm pretty open about this but i i use better help uh so i speak to a therapist weekly uh she's great like she like really un she gets me which is cool um and she floated the idea by me that i might be a highly sensitive person or an hsp um and so uh Something that uh, I, I've been reading more about, right, is it's not just like you cry at movies all the time, which is like maybe something I do. I'm not going to confirm or deny that I definitely do that. Um, but that you're very sensitive to like your senses are elevated. And so like you are very sensitive to like strong smells and loud sounds and sudden sounds. And that was very illuminating for me. So like maybe your mission statement could be like you help highly sensitive people get into a, a, a mindset uh, in a in a very non highly sensitive person world, so I think that's I think that's really interesting. I think if you nail down who you help and make that clear, that could be a really cool idea for a mini podcast. I love that. So, uh, Marquita, good to see you. Um, thanks so much for for showing your face and asking that great question. Um, okay, so uh, let me get uh, back to the presentation because now we're going to get to the real magic where's my browser um now we're going to get to like the real magic of uh what makes a mini podcast so great am i sharing my screen now zoom you're kind of confusing me pal uh okay there we go um so let's get into the uh this part batching your content this is especially great for people who have not started yet uh, but if you have started take a short break let your listeners know hey i'm taking a few weeks off um because a mini podcast because you're not beholden to anyone's schedule allows you to block time on your calendar to get ahead and so what i recommend is outlining 10 to 12 episodes block an hour to record all right with a mini episode depending on the length you can record probably three or four within an hour but let's conservatively say three you record those uh if you're using descript you are you can probably edit pretty quickly if you've scripted then you can edit even more quickly because you've already said everything you need to say and you just need to make sure everything sounds good You've already probably told the story you want to tell. Schedule for in advance. If you are doing a monthly podcast, this gives you one month lead time for the next four episodes. If you're doing something different, like every other week or fortnightly, trying to bring it back. Uh, if you're doing a fortnightly podcast, this gives you two months in advance. So schedule for in advance, block an hour to record. If you do uh, an hour to record every week, then you're constantly going to stay three to four weeks ahead. This is what I'm doing with my daily podcast. At the end of, I, I recorded, I think, 15 ahead of time. And then every Friday, I record five more. So that I always, I'm always a week two weeks ahead of where I need to be, right? Um, doing it that way also allows me to react a little bit more because if I'm batching a whole month ahead, 
and some news happens, now I have to adjust my whole production schedule. But saying one to two weeks ahead, that allows me to react a little bit more to say YouTube introducing RSS ingestion for podcasts, right? So batching is really where the magic happens here because you this will work fully on your schedule. And again, if you are just launching, you can do two or three months, right? And so like you've launched and now you're getting some feedback and you're working on the next quarter's worth of content, which is great. Okay, so you've got your mission statement. You've got your topics. You're going to use Descript to record and edit and you're batching your content. You still need to publish it somewhere though. And so right here, I'm going to give a quick disclosure that I'm going to give the recommendation that I've been giving for the last year or so. And then I'm going to make another recommendation. Uh, and I am affiliated with the uh, the second recommendation. So I'll tell you more in a minute. I don't want to spoil the surprise, uh, though I think some people on the, on the webinar already know. Uh, and I'll give my rationale for both. Okay, so number one. Buzzsprout. This is the one I've been recommending for many podcasts for a couple of years now because they have a fairly generous free plan, right? I think you can, they'll automatically delete episodes after 90 days, but they'll give you two hours of upload time a month. This is plenty of time to figure out if you like podcasting, right? Um, and so uh, they also offer dynamic content which is something that allows you to mix up your call to action and things like that. Uh, and they directly integrate with Descript. So if you want to record, edit, and publish, you can do that uh, all within Descript if you use Buzzsprout. So that's what I've been recommending. And I know people have been very happy with that. However, uh, if you are ready to pay for hosting, which I strongly recommend you do, I free hosting is not the way forward if you're serious about your podcast. I firmly believe that because free hosting means that you're giving up something else, either an archive, right? Who only wants the last three months of podcasts after they've done 100 episodes or 200 episodes? autonomy in the case of anchor slash Spotify for podcasters. Like you don't really own your podcast when you're using anchor. Uh, so I strongly recommend you pay. And if you're going to pay, I strongly recommend rss.com, which again, full, uh, full disclosure, I am rss.com's uh, evangelist, which means they pay me to talk about them. But one of the reasons I decided to become their evangelist is because when I met them and I learned about RSS.com, I legitimately thought if I knew about RSS.com before I went to my current hosting company, I probably would have gone with RSS.com, right? There's one feature that they don't have that my current hosting company has, um, but that there are ways around that. So RSS.com, super affordable. It starts at like five bucks a month for students and, and nonprofits. Um, and then I think it goes up to like 10 bucks a month. Or if you want multiple podcasts, 15 bucks a month. Really competitive pricing. They also include free transcripts with any paid plan, translated into multiple languages. They'll upload your podcast to YouTube for you. Uh, and so I, I just think they have a lot of really great features. Their web player is really neat. It works very, it works in a, a way, it almost works like the way that podcast apps work, which I haven't seen with others. So, um, and you can set up for, you can set your podcast up for free, no credit card required. So um, I've recommended Buzzsprout for a long time because I think like it's really good for solo podcasters, but rss.com as far as like audio quality and feature set, uh, are pretty unmatched unless you want a private podcast uh, or like dynamic ad uh, or dynamic content insertion. Um, but I think if you're starting out rss.com, um, like if you don't need those things, rss.com is really great. Um, so those are the two places where I'd recommend that you start. Again, if you want to, like, if, like if, if you're thinking, I'll put it this way. Um, 
both have a both have the ability to launch your podcast for free. Um, I think Buzzsprout's. I, I mean, uh, let me confirm this. I know that there's. I don't know if this person wants to be like outed, but uh, <laughs> I know there's someone else here who who is familiar with RSS.com's plans. Um, I think when you want to, you can launch your podcast and when you want to publish, that's when it costs money. Um, and which again, I strongly recommend that you do. Um, so uh, let's see. Oh, I've got, oh, let's see. Got some questions coming in. Oh, uh, do you have a recommendation for to get license free audio? Yes, I do. Uh, Cecilia, um, let me finish this quick spiel, uh, and then uh, and then I'll totally talk about that because I I just realized what time it was. Um, so anyway, I strongly recommend you pay for hosting, and if you are uh, ready to do that, um, oh cool. Okay, so actually, uh, my compatriot at rss.com, um, free if you want to publish an episode. The second episode is where they charge. Great, so you can get set up, you record an episode, see how you like it. Uh, and then, uh, and then get started there. And again, if you're just like, I want to publish for two months without paying just to see if I like it, then, then I would recommend Buzzsprout. Right. But if you're serious about podcasting, I recommend you pay. And if you're going to pay for podcast hosting, RSS.com's value versus features, I honestly believe a second to none. So, Okay. Uh, so you need to have a good CTA. Let me answer Cecilia's question first though. Um, do I have recommendations for where to get license-free audio for intros and outros? Uh, there are a couple, um, Descript has a pretty good library of music. I think at the, I think with any paid plan, I don't know if it's on the free plan, but they have a pretty good library of music and sound effects royalty free, uh, built right into the app. Uh, as far as other places, uh, there's Music for Makers by Logan Nicholson. I've I've used that. That's I think 150 bucks one time, and he puts out new music. It used to be weekly, but I don't know. It is it is regularly. Uh, so that's Music for Makers. Uh, dot com, um, and then Envato's Elements, like Envato Elements. I know people have opinions about Envato, or at least people in the web development space had opinions about Envato, but um black friday's coming up they're probably going to run a black friday sale where you can get it for some ridiculous amount of money off but they'll give you access to their whole royalty free stock library of music sound effects graphics photos and i think i think like full price it's like 200 bucks a year um which is still good value but i have no doubt that you'll be able to get a discount around black friday um, so those are two, those are three places that I recommend you could go to get royalty free music for intros, outros. Uh, if anybody has any other recommendations, feel free to drop them in the chat. Okay. So have a good call to action. Uh, Pixel Bay, Pixel Bay. Uh, I know that Pixel Bay was a thing for images and Pirate Bay was the thing for pirating stuff, but Pixel Bay, I haven't seen that one before. Um, Okay, sweet. Pixabay.com slash music. Sweet. Uh, I'm going to check that one out after this. Uh, okay, so have a good call to action. Thank you, Ashley, by the way. Um, when you have a mini podcast, you want to make sure that you're telling your audience to go someplace or do something. This needs to be super clear. Uh, it needs to be a super clear action that you want your listeners to take. Right. Again, there's another Star Wars reference as uh, if for those of you who know me, you'll know I make those a lot, but needs to be a super clear action you want your listeners to take. We only have I'm going to say one ear when people are listening to us. They're doing something else. They're at the gym. They're doing chores. They're I've I've mowed the lawn uh, with noise canceling headphones and listen to a podcast. I usually listen to a podcast while I'm trying to cook dinner for my three kids and my my youngest runs into me full speed into my stomach. Uh, it's really hard for me to really pay full attention, right? Um, or they're driving and they take they can't take immediate action or shouldn't take immediate action, right? So this needs to be a super clear, easy action you want your listeners to take. 
Here are a few good calls to action. Singular, clear, easy to complete. Join the mailing list, right? Say, hey, join the mailing list if you want more stuff like this. Check out the show notes. That's like the super secret way to get people to take multiple actions, right? Hey, head over to the show notes at howibuilt.it slash 334 to join the mailing list, become a member, or do everything that we talked about here. Uh, or, right, notice I have the ors here, right? You want one, you want them to do essentially one primary thing. Write and then ask questions, right? Give an email address or a URL where they could submit feedback. Or share with a friend. The URL is blah, 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 right? If you know somebody who would enjoy this, share it with a friend. Um, I will say, right, like you could ask them to rate and review you. Um, it does not help you rise the charts. Apple has said this multiple times. What it does do is provide social proof. So reviews are good, but they're not going to help you like become number one on the charts. That is strictly like a combination of of like percentage of new listeners, I think. Um, bad calls to action. Too many and how is not clear. Rate and review us on iTunes. First of all, it hasn't been called iTunes for years. Second of all, half of podcast listeners at best use Apple Podcasts, which means the other half uh, is not going to know what you're talking about or will not be able to take action. Uh, so rate and review us on iTunes and subscribe wherever in whatever podcast player you use uh, and check out the thing in the link in the show notes and make sure to join our mailing list and share with a friend without ever telling them how to do that. Right. Uh, that is bad. You want it to be clear. You want to give them an easy to remember, easy to speak URL uh, or say like, Hey, check out the description. Everything is there. My favorite call to action is join my mailing list, especially if you have a mini podcast because you're helping them solve a problem. So it's very natural to say, hey, if you liked this episode, my mailing list has even more ways to solve this problem. Sign up over at joinmymailinglist.com, right? Uh, and it's really easy for people to want to do that because you've provided them free value and now you're telling them you're going to help them even more. Now, there is one question. Where does it go? Where should you put your call to action? I have that here because I used to, whoops, uh, I used to say, make it the first thing. Make your call to action the first 30 seconds of your episode. And I was really all in on that. Oh, 30 to 60 seconds uh, is, is fine when you're about to provide them 20 minutes worth of value. But then I realized uh, in, in uh, no small... Uh, effort by Neil Veglio. I think I, I'm, I think I'm saying his last name correctly. Um, that a call to action right at the beginning of your podcast is kind of like you walking into a store and the over eager stores clerk, like store clerk walks right up to you. Like before you're even through those metal detector thingies um, and says like, Hey, do you want to buy something? Right? Like, well, I mean, like I'm interested in what you're doing here, but like, give me some space, right? You're, you're, you're asking before you're providing value. And for someone, especially who's listening for the first time, that's not going to be great. So I would say make your call to action after the first value point and make your first value point easy um, or early rather. So with how I built it, I give a cold open and then I give an intro where I tell them the things that they're going to learn. And then I'll put my call to action after that. Uh, so I would say put it within the first five minutes and make sure you provide value before that, you can mention it at the end too, but you've lost like 70% of listeners by the end. That's why I, I, that's why I've been bullish about putting it early, but I don't think it should be the first thing anymore. Okay, let's run through these last couple of things really quick. Where are you going to promote newsletter, social media, repurpose content? I feel like 2023 has been the year of repurpose content. What you should actually do is set up a, a little bit of a content flywheel. So I'm going to show you two. This is what I was doing at the beginning of the year versus what I'm doing now. I find, excuse me, uh, I find content to repurpose. I create a LinkedIn post. I turn that LinkedIn post into a podcast outline. I turn that outline into a podcast episode, and then I turn that episode into a newsletter, and then that becomes more content to repurpose, which is why it has become a flywheel. I have stopped doing that. In part, 
because now I'm trying to do long form content first and tell more stories. And so now I start with podcast outline. What's the story I'm trying to tell with this episode? That turns into a podcast episode. That episode becomes a newsletter. That newsletter becomes a LinkedIn post. And the LinkedIn post becomes content for me to repurpose elsewhere. Now, somewhere in there, probably like two step 2.5 is take this and put the podcast episode in, in Cast Magic, which is like one of these AI summarization tools. Uh, not because I'm going to like gratuitously use that feature or the output, but it's going to surface things that maybe I forgot, interesting points that maybe I forgot, and give me some timestamps for direct quotes. So it makes me discovering content from the podcast episode a little bit easier. So this is my current flywheel. I'm I'm going podcast first because I want to create long form content because uh, it was Jay Klaus. He gave a great talk at Craft and Commerce about how uh, making something out of sawdust is really hard versus re versus creating something and then using the sawdust that's created from that. So uh, you wouldn't build like a crib out of sawdust. You would build a crib from, from wood, like proper wood, and then take that sawdust and reuse it for something else. Same thing goes with content. You create short form content. It's really hard to take short form content and turn it into long form content, but you take long form content now you take some of the sawdust, maybe some of the research you did that you didn't get to use, or you break that up into smaller pieces and you share it across social media. Okay, let's end with making money and then I'll get to some of the questions. Uh, I have a Smash framework. It's called the Smash framework. Sponsorships, memberships, affiliates, selling, and helping. Uh, I have a PDF that runs through all of these. I think a lot of them are are... Uh, pretty self-explanatory. Sponsorships is, is ads during the show. Memberships are people paying you directly for your content. Affiliate is you promote something and you get a percentage. Uh, but then there's selling and helping. How you make money is going to depend on your mission statement and it should align with the problem you help your podcast solve. So uh, that like, you know, if you have a podcast about how, uh, you know, affiliates affiliate links are not a great way to make money, then maybe affiliate links are not the best thing to use. Um, but I think for most people who are starting a mini podcast and solving a specific problem, selling and helping are the ways that you can make money. What does this mean? You sell a product that solves a problem or you help people through coaching courses and consulting because your mini podcast is helping you establish your authority. And then your call to action could be if you like this, if you want direct help from me, go to this page and sign up for my coaching program or set up a, a discovery call or join my mailing list to learn more about how I can help you directly. So that's a quick overview of the Smash framework. Now, I do have a special offer for you before I get to the questions. Um, I have a membership called the Podcast Foundry. Uh, members get access to... Uh, How I Built It Pro, which is my ad-free extended uh, episodes of my podcast. They get a newsletter every week about how I'm automating some part of my podcast, access to my automations library, live stream archives. The people in my membership will get this replay after 72 hours. And then I'm also going to be doing more workshops and community events. Right now, it's 250 bucks a year. Uh, the price is going to double by the end of December. So Already, that's a special deal. But I also, um, I like to offer member, like people who join the webinar, a free podcast audit when you become an annual member. Now, if you already have a podcast, uh, that's great. If you don't have a podcast, a podcast audit wouldn't help. So what I will do for members who sign up after this webinar is get on a free 30-minute call with you uh, and help you hash out your mini podcast idea, give you a, a complete personalized blueprint. So instead of an audit, we'll spend some time and I'll create your launch plan, your personalized launch plan for you. Uh, so again, that's over at podcastworkflows.com slash join. If you sign up between now 
and what's today's Thursday. If you sign up between now and Sunday, uh, you'll automatically get either the blueprint or the audit. You just let me know which one. Uh, so again, that's podcastworkflows.com slash join. Okay, so that's everything for me. Thanks so much for coming. I'm going to stay as long as I need to to answer questions. If you need to drop off, feel free. If you have questions that you didn't ask in the spreadsheet, also feel free or on the sign up form, also feel free to ask them here. Uh, so now let's get to the questions. Uh, so I'm going to bring up this spreadsheet here. I'll also be monitoring the chat. Um, so let me find my browser. Right. Uh, I kind of forget that I go into like full screen mode uh, on um, on Canva when I'm presenting. All right, so running through these questions, uh, how to overcome perfectionist tendencies when recording solo episodes from Linda. Linda, this is, uh, if you're watching the replay or for anybody who else who's worried about this, uh, this is a really big one, right? Because you get worried. I had a friend who... Um, never thought like his voiceovers were good enough for the videos that he created. Right. Um, I say the more you get your reps in, the more comfortable you'll feel. Right. And so um, I think it comes with experience, but continually telling yourself done is better than perfect or 80% or I'll, I'll, I'll be even better the next go around. That's kind of how I get over those perfectionist tendencies. Um, so, uh, I think that's probably the best way. Well, I'm not going to say it's the best way. It's how I do it. I just try to tell myself, okay, next time I'm going to be better. Right. The first time I added like weird sound effects into a podcast, I thought, uh, these feel really campy. I'm a little bit uncomfortable, but I'm going to release it anyway, because I know that this is a really important, this could be a really cool and important part of the experience. Um, now I've honed that a little better and I like fade them in a little bit better. And so I think, um, as you learn your craft, you will feel more comfortable. Um, Carrie asked, do you focus on creating compelling engagement and story in the second act? Since this is where many stories fall apart. Great question, Carrie. Uh, I try to, yes, I try When I tell my stories when I do my podcast episodes, I try to create that tension right in the second act that kind of gets people to lean in and say, Oh, what do you mean? Right. And so like in a recent episode, um, I asked my guest, right. She wrote a book called good, good, awkward. Her name's Hannah Pryor. I said, I mean, we should just avoid being awkward, right? We should completely avoid that. And she says, no, we should lean into it. And that creates the tension. Like, wait, what do you mean we should try to like enjoy being awkward? Uh, so yes, I do try to create the tension there or um, engagement there. And that's really like creating some tension or some conflict. Um, and it doesn't have to be like a big battle, like like Avenger style battle. It could just be like a little um, objection that people might have to what your guest is saying or what you're saying. Um, how, of, how a host can avoid rambling about a topic and keep content concise and engaged. This is from Cecilia. Um, scripting and outlines uh, scripting especially right but i'll go off script sometimes um but outlines those will keep you honest and then if you record in descript and you're like oh man i went off the rails there it's easy to stop recording just delete what you said and, and continue going um thoughts on scripting episodes and maybe ideas or a framework that can help with this uh that's from carrie um so i talked a lot about scripting episodes ideas or frameworks there's like a couple one is the problem, like in marketing copy, there's like the problem agitate solution framework where you state the problem, you agitate it a little bit, uh, and then you provide a solution. I think that could be a good format for many for many podcast episodes since you are solving a problem. So it's like, uh, do you have trouble falling asleep at night? You say they're lying awake, tossing and turning, uh, wondering if you're going to get any sleep before you have to wake up at 5 a.m. for your job. Uh, now I've stated the problem and I've agitated it. Like, yeah, I was just tossing and turning the other night. Um, have you tried not using your phone before bed, right? Like that, like whatever the solution is. Um, so I think that like problem agitate solution can really help here. Um, that was, that was Carrie. Uh, so Demetrius asked um, what recommended best practices for under 20 minutes per episode. I think I, I covered that pretty well, Tony, if I didn't let me know. Uh, or I'm sorry, Demetrius, if I didn't, let me know. Um, 
software for recording other than GarageBand, Logic, and Zoom. Mark, uh, Descript is where it's at. Uh, does it make sense to mix with extracts from my live stream show? Ted asked that. I think it could, right? If you have like clips and things like that, I think keep you want to keep the story and you want to solve the problem, right? Uh, so if it's just like a random clip, no, that doesn't make sense. But if like you have a segment of your live stream where like some current event happened and you're commenting on it and how it can affect your audience, yeah, that would be great. Um, Harry asked, why are you so awesome? Thank you, Harry. Uh, <laughs> mixing solo episodes with a monthly guest. That's from Cesar. I think I touched on that quite a bit here. Uh, what about just reading a newsletter as a podcast idea? David, that's a great question. I will do that. As long as you're telling a good story uh, or solving a specific problem, I think that's that's great. You're repurposing content. Um, and so I've I've experimented with that. So my mini podcast, my daily podcast is a lot of that. So uh, I think if you can make it work, uh, really great. Um, different Tony asks how to overcome the chicken and egg paradox. Not quite. Uh, don't quite know what you mean by that, Tony, but I will say um if you are, if you mean like, should you launch and then record or should you record and then launch? I, I'm going to interpret it that way. Having a back catalog of episodes, especially before you launch, is one of the best ways to prevent pod fade, um, which is, you know, not pod, like starting a podcast and then stopping it. Uh, monetization with a small audience from Derval. That's a whole other topic. Um, but I think the um, the best thing that you can do, right, is with a mini podcast, kind of sell your services. Um, and then, uh, oh, Ashley, a bunch of stuff just ready to learn. Thanks so much, Ashley. Uh, so that's everything. And wow, most of you stuck through all of the questions. David, who is live, I just answered your question. If you repurpose your newsletter issues to audio, how do you add that uh, special flavor you mentioned before? Yeah, great question. So I'll usually, what I'll do is I'll take the newsletter. Um, I'll read it to make sure it's still relevant because in some cases I'm taking newsletters I sent over a year ago. And so some of that might not be relevant anymore. So I'll I'll, I'll read it uh, and make sure it's still relevant. And then I will add little anecdotes that I maybe didn't include because I wanted to keep it pithier for the newsletter. So um, for example, uh, actually let me... I'm like drawing a blank, but I just, I like just did this uh, for a mini episode um, about doing, oh yes, doing a behind the scenes episode or, uh, you know, what? actually uh, better is um, I have an episode coming out if I haven't released it already um, about podcast swaps, right? So in the newsletter, I might've just sent like, Hey, uh, here's how you should do podcast swaps, right? But in the podcast, I tell a story about friends, right? And if you've seen me do this sh this shtick, you'll know. Um, I talk about how friends uh, did crossover episodes in season one, and that increased their viewership by 20%. And so I'll start with that story. And because I'm telling it auditorially, um, I add that little flair. And, and maybe I add a little bit of audio from a, that friend's episode, right? Um, in a newsletter I wrote a couple weeks ago, uh, I talked about the importance of digital storytelling and I talked about how Taylor Swift is a really good storyteller. The song All Too Well, the 10 minute version, like she she takes what I, what I have to imagine to most people would be a mundane celebrity breakup and weaves amazing stories like weaves an amazing story where you feel it. She says she's a crumpled up piece of paper. Um, she says, you know, you kept me like a secret, but I kept you like an oath. Like it really paints a picture. And so I used uh, some clips from that song to really highlight what I was trying to say here. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but I think that falls under fair use, right? It's on YouTube and YouTube's not like yelling at me to take it down or anything. So um, little things like that can help you add that little extra flavor. Um, Cecilia, any recommendations for creating cover art? Yeah, so I go, uh, there's um, there's a video in the Foundry, actually, that covers this. Um, and it's something that I talk about in my uh, in my audits a lot. But you, your podcast artwork is a lot like a book cover. Uh, you have a square that needs to stand out. Um, and so what you wanted to communicate is a few things. First of all, 
Um, David, no problem. Um, I'll usually use Canva for this, um, but you could use like Photoshop or whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, faces attract our eyes naturally, right? So if you have a picture of you, um, that will generally draw people uh, to it. Uh, you also want to have the name of the show and the value proposition in some way, shape, or form. So uh, if we look at uh, my artwork for um, podcast workflows, right? I don't have my face on this, but I have this little unique graphic here. I have the name and then I have love your podcast process. I also used purple because I noticed a lot of podcasts um, don't use purple. And so I figured that color might stand out a little bit, um, but it's really tough. What I would recommend you do is go to the category where you're thinking about launching, see what those people are doing and where your eye is drawn and kind of take stock of like what they've done to draw your eye. Right. Cause like every business podcast is like white guy with arms folded on black background. Right. And it's called like the name of white guy podcast. Um, and so like, I wouldn't recommend anybody do that. Right. But if, if you, um, if you find good artwork that, that catches your attention, kind of see what they do um, and how you can integrate it into yours, I think is the best way. I'm not, I would also say like, I'm not the best designer. Um, I don't think that's like shocking to anybody. Um, but uh, my friend Nate Kaldek and uh, Kay He uh, did a webinar about podcast artwork recently. So I would, I would try to find, uh, Nate Kaldak. I'll see if I can like drop his Twitter in the chat real quick. Um, but he he has been putting out some content. Um, uh, yeah, I'll I will find him because now I think I'm like maybe saying and spelling his name incorrectly. Uh, and I will uh, I'll try to drop him in the chat. Um, but he's been putting out like real. He's a designer and he's been putting out really good advice about uh about podcast artwork. Oh, Cadlac. First of all, so I was saying his name incorrectly. Um, but here is, here's his name. So you can find him on the socials. He's a guy who's wearing uh, fun, like drawn on glasses in his, uh, in his profile pictures. Um, so that's all the questions. If there are, I, I will, uh, oh, Cecilia, you're very welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I'll, I'll give it about 30 seconds just in case there's a delay. Um, but thank you all so much for coming and for like going into overtime with me. Um, I really appreciate that. I know like spending over an hour on like a webinar can be really like tiring. Um, and so I appreciate you saying for the whole thing, uh, I will send a follow-up email with everything I talked about the slides and a replay link, uh, that will be good until Sunday. Uh, after Sunday, it will become part of the podcast foundry. Uh, but thank you all for being here. Uh, David, Cecilia, Ruth, thanks so much for your comments and questions. Cesar, if you're still here, thanks so much. Uh, and then Ashley, thanks so much for the assist on the RSS.com stuff. Really appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody. Uh, and I will see you soon.